and I like uh, to invite Dr. Igal Bilik to lead the sensing and perception discussion panel. Dr. Igal Bilik from the School of Engineering and Computer Engineering at the Ben Gurion University is an expert in sensing and automation vehicles. Prior to joining Ben Gurion University, he led the research and development of sensor of sensor technologies for General Motors vehicles. In addition, uh, he currently leading Ben Gurion University race team autonomous development, as well as the civil radar community in the IEEE radar systems panel and IEEE vehicular technologies chap chapter in Israel. Egal, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Tia. So I would like to invite our today panelists. So the first is uh, Oren Rosenfeld, who is the co-founder and chief business officer from Innovis, where he leads uh, product and sale activities. Welcome, Oren. Thank you. <coughs> the second panelist is uh, Avi Bakal, the CEO and founder from 3i. Welcome, Avi. Arno Navgin, the co-founder and CEO of Ratsi. Okay, so welcome everyone, and I would like to start our panel by giving you opportunity to present you company in a few words. So let's probably start from uh, offer. Okay, thank you. Do I need a microphone? Yes. Yes. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, as I will present it, I'm offer David from Brighter Vision. Is that better? Okay, so let's go on. So I'm Ofer David, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me here. Um, what we do at Brightway, we develop a camera, but it's a special camera. It's a camera that is built out of two units, an illuminator and a sensor that receives the reflection. It's a set of time of flight sensor, it's not a regular sensor. It's based on a gated chip that we've developed. And what it does actually, it enables the camera to see uh, under darkness and harsh weather conditions. Um, and we operate our camera in parallel to the daytime camera, so we are an extension to the day ca daytime camera. You know, all sensor suits actually have the daytime camera. We haven't seen yet a sensor suit without the camera. And now if you have a camera, you want this camera to operate also at nighttime and in rainy condition, in fog. Uh, <coughs> so we, that's what we come in. That's what we come in, that's what Brightway solves. Similar to the human eye, if you think about it, because also in the human eyes we have two photoreceptors, one for color high resolution and one for nighttime uh, vision. Uh, taking into account that the report that was published by NHTSA that 76% of pedestrians were killed at night, uh, in darkness, not at night, sorry, because night can be an illuminated zone uh, still. Uh, in darkness, uh, this uh, part should be taken care of. Um, we, uh, the nice thing about this camera that they also all the algorithms that you've developed to a regular visible camera will operate very nicely on the gated vision image. Um, we see mo the, the first uh, extension that we see for this, uh, the use case for this uh, technology is uh, L4 autonomous trucks because they must drive uh, at night unlike uh, regular sensors. So in summary, it won't take too much time. So. In summary, we develop eyes. Uh, we focus on the eyes, not the brains, uh, for harsh weather conditions and nighttime conditions. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, great to see everybody live. Uh, what Tri is doing, we're developing one of a kind uh, swirl sensing technology based on about a decade of academic research here at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, basically, we provide a vision under any uh, visibility and weather condition. Um, this is uh, what we do. Thank you. And the first, uh, I'm going to start by Amnon Swarabi. Please 
Tashi and Igal for inviting me to this uh, great panel. Uh, about Ratsi, Ratsi has uh, first has a great team uh, with a, a lot of experience in the in the radar field, like my uh, partner, uh, Professor Associate Professor Dan Rafaelik in the University of Tel Aviv. So uh, Ratsi's strategy is to use off-the-shelf components from the well-known uh, companies in the automotive industry and provides a very unique uh, radar technology with outstanding performance and game-changing cost structure for the current and uh, future applications. So how we are doing it? Uh, Razzi owns uh, uh, antenna, patented antenna and system architecture and combine it with our unique algorithms, we can uh, achieve or meet uh, our customers' goals. Uh, by using this, uh, this strategy, uh, Razzi achieve uh, a very attractive radar cost with a very high performance and still be uh, cheap agnostic. On one hand, we minimize the entrance obstacles. On the other hand, uh, it's a very high barrier for our customers, for our competitors. Um, also, Razzi has uh, uh, actually scalable platform, as you can see here, that uh, meets all radar requirements. It means kind of one-stop shop which is very important to our uh, customers also. And more than this, we have a flexible uh, solution that fits all, uh, fits the tier ones and OEMs system, which is very important to them in order to control the process and build a tailor-made uh, solution. By doing this, by doing all this, so we achieved a minimized we minimize the risk for our uh, customers and for our investors. So um, just uh, to recap the uniqueness of Ratsi, please uh, remember the top five advantages of Ratsi technology is uh, cost, uh, performance, scalability, flexibility, and minimize the risk. Thank you, Adam. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Oren from Innovis. We are a supplier of uh, lighters, and um, I guess that if you chose to sit in this uh, exclusive workshop, then I don't need to tell you what lighters are. Um, if you want to see ours specifically, we were presenting it uh, live in the adjacent room. Um, as, as an Israeli startup company, I mean, we're, I guess we're, we're very proud of uh, two main things. One, that you know, we, we achieved to, achieve to become like a a prominent supplier of, of lighters in the automotive industry, which is not an easy thing to do. And two, that uh, I guess the, the more recent news that uh, we've become a publicly traded company as of a few months ago, uh, which gives us kind of the runway and uh, the funding to, you know, to continue becoming and, and growing as a, as a major supplier in this industry. That's it. Thank you. So the So if we look at the uh, sensor suits, there are a few candidates that are considered to be part of the sensor suit. Um, cameras, definitely there. As I said before, we haven't seen a sensor suit without a camera. Leaders and radars are there, but as was said in the beginning, some, some choose, not to choose not to work with them. We, as human beings, when we drive, we use only vision, so we use cameras. Uh, stereo cameras, so we have some estimation on, on range, although you can drive also with one eye open. Uh, so if, and, and uh, there is a SWIR, a candidate here, so we address the SWIR as well. 
uh, and three are actually a camera as well, only operating at a different wavelength. Uh, and if you look, imagine um, two parameters, um, ambient ability to see through, I mean, lightning conditions and weather conditions, and the second parameter is resolution. There are other parameters, but let's focus on these two parameters. So in terms of re resolution, um, <coughs> cameras, of course, uh, lead, um, lead the way. Um, then the next one in line would be the leaders, 0.1 degree approximately, still an order of two orders of magnitude less than cameras. And then the radars at the end, although there is a representative here for a very nice radar with uh, high resolution. Uh, so this is the, the, the scale of the resolution uh, cameras. Now, if you look at the ambient, condi uh, ambient conditions, so cameras work, current cameras work well uh, at daytime, at nighttime, sphere cameras maybe, uh, gated vision cameras definitely will work well at uh, nighttime. But then leaders uh, have some, um, we see some uh, um, uh, limitations at harsh weather and uh, radars will penetrate uh, weather again uh, very well. Um, I advise the audience to, to take a look at a consortium, a European consortium called DANCE as the first step and then the second step is uh, AIC, which actually uh, tested the various sensors and sensor suit for harsh weather and nighttime and, and darkness. Um, when I say nighttime, I mean darkness. Uh, and they published a few papers about performance under harsh weather conditions of the various sensors. So that's my view. So camera, cameras will definitely be there, leaders and uh, radars, maybe redundancy or. You don't expect me to say no, do you? Um, no, the, the answer is, is obviously yes, and I don't want to repeat uh, anything that uh, Ofer already said uh, before. Um, I, I think you know it's it's pretty much clear. I mean, there is maybe one exception, one one person that uh, that is claiming the um, contrary, and it's it's hard to um, prove a negative. But uh, I think pretty much everybody thinks that uh, that that person from from Tesla is, is wrong. So I think the Complement, like the complementarity of, uh, of sensors, the kind of in inverse correlation in situations where they fail, uh, like I think Ofer just kind of uh, alluded to, uh, in terms of weather conditions, being able to detect small objects on the road, um, I, I think kind of says that at least in the foreseeable future, uh, nobody's gonna try and solve L3 and, and L4 without uh, LIDARs and, and radars, and um, at least until I see a first L3 in, in the sense that an OEM is willing to take responsibility for the driving and if something goes wrong, um, you know, it's, it's the OEM's fault, which kind of, I think, yields a very high threshold in terms of probability of, uh, of making a mistake, which is, by the way, much higher than the probability of a human being making a mistake. I mean, uh, any OEM that would take the responsibility for the number of accidents that, that, that is happening today just by human beings will, will go out of business uh, very quickly. And I think the you know the, the threshold for, for getting to L3 for taking that kind of responsibility, which nobody has ever taken so far, um, is is so high. Then I think kind of nobody is going to try and do it without anything, everything that they can get uh, with the advantages of, of lidars and, and and of course also radars. Uh, first, let me start by saying that uh, I'm not the one who choosing the sensor suit. At the end, it's the system architect in each uh, OEMs or uh, tier one suppliers. Um, as Offer uh, said, there are various uh, sensing modalities, camera, LIDAR, uh, radar. Um, we believe that uh, vision, that based on cameras, is uh, essential. It's the core for any uh, perception system. And as we provide a very unique modality that can cover the basic uh, visible camera, which are great when the skies are blue. Um, but let's take a very simple example uh, because this is a technical uh, workshop. Uh, let's take a very simple example of uh, when you have sun, uh, you're interfacing the sun. Uh, which happening every day. Um, 
So there are cameras that can, you know, work in those uh, um, environment, but mostly they will fail. And uh, here is just an example of how try solution uh, can uh, overcome uh, those gaps. And in general, uh, try uh, as a company uh, provide vision under any weather and lighting condition, uh, and that's in a, in a cost structure that's uh, at the same cost of a regular visible camera. And that's why I think uh, the different OEMs out there and the different tier ones see our solution as a vital part of their sensor suit. Um, yes, it's very, very unique. You cannot find it anywhere at the moment, uh, but it opens doors and um, provide L2, L3, L4, when it comes, uh, who knows? Uh, it provides capabilities that currently the ADA suits just doesn't have. Okay, so um, AV is the future uh, for the transportation. That's, that's, we understand that's why we are all here. So AV requires uh, human-like or higher reliability. It's very difficult to achieve it with one type of uh, sensors. In some conditions, you must use a radar. So if the vision is that sensors will um, drive the car, so it will be a combination of all type of uh, sensors like uh, radar, camera, and, um, and, uh, and LiDAR, and others. But uh, let's agree about the goal. If the goal is to find and distinguish objects uh, around the car in all weather and light conditions, once, Egal, we said in all weather and light conditions, actually we said, please use a radar. So, uh, so the advantages, yes, the advantages of the radar is uh, using in all weather and light conditions, accurate velocity and range information. Uh, also easy to install. You can install the radar anywhere even behind the bumpers, uh, can operate with dirt and mud and maximum range. For sure, radar uh, has a lot of you know, challenges like angular resolution and um, I think uh, lack of AI research so far. So as I said about the angular resolution, uh, RAD-C uh, think how to uh, solve or uh, deal with this uh, issue. So we are doing it with a very smart hardware and uh, unique uh, algorithms uh, besides uh, super resolution and other unique resolution. So it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's one gap that we deal with. Uh, the other one is multipath that um, in order to mitigate the impact of the multipath. So beyond the algorithm that we develop uh, in RAD-C, uh, the fusion with the camera can resolve it. Uh, execution. Uh, I think yeah, it's about execution. Uh, we are in 2021, um, you know, three, four years ago, yes, all of us can uh, shout out some uh, uh, marketing materials and talking about specs who doesn't really uh, align with real, real world performances. Uh, but currently it's about execution. Uh, we as a tri we are running about four years as a company and 10 years before that, it's time to deliver. Uh, Working with OEMs, uh, deliver what you promised in real field. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the biggest challenges. Um, yeah. My answer is actually quite similar to Avi's, I think. So 
Um, you know, I, I think we have in, in Israel here some of the smartest minds uh, in the world. And uh, luckily, I think um, <clears throat> a big part of them is kind of directing their uh, very high IQ towards solving uh, automotive and specifically autonomous problems. Um, and we've got some of them in, in Innovis actually, but um, I, I think what we realized over the last, especially over the last four years since we started working with BMW, for example, um, is that making a, making a cool technology is not the same as making a product for automotive. And, um, and I think maybe also relates to one of the, the points that you, you guys want to kind of take out of the, the workshop today, which is kind of what is missing. And, and that's uh, people that really know how to develop automotive products. Uh, we're having an incredibly hard time finding those. Uh, people that understand functional safety, ISO 26262. Uh, people that understand automotive spice, in terms of how to do software in automotive. Uh, people who understand uh, industrialization of, of products in automotive. Uh, supplier management, know how to talk with, with the OEMs. Uh, there is, I mean, there are zero OEMs in Israel. Um, there is, you know, very few kind of uh, suppliers in this industry in an advanced stage. We're one of them, obviously. Mobile was there before us. Uh, <clears throat> so getting the talent that we need is just incredibly difficult. And um, un unless you're building a very big R&D center in, in Germany or somewhere else, then um, uh, it's really hard to kind of have the, um, the firepower that you need to, to execute, like Avi said. You need hundreds of people that, that know this kind of stuff, hundreds of people. And uh, there are very few of them in Israel. So that's, uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. So I must say that most have been said already. I do agree with the previous speakers. Auto solving the, the technical problem is only half the problem. Then you have to bring it into the automotive. In automotive, price and reliability, it's, these are main, main major factors. I mean, if you come to an OEM, sometimes he will tell you that these are more important than the technical solution. He will, um, he will sacrifice performance for reliability and price. And most of us, uh, coming from defense uh, uh, applications, where we were educated the other way around, first of all, solve the problem. Price, you'll deal with it later. Reliability, you'll deal with it later. No, that's not the case in automotive. And we are lacking the people who know how to do it. Uh, this is one part, automotive, uh, um, I would say engineering, specific for automotive. The second part that we, we see that is lacking is um, how to validate products for automotive. This is also something that is lacking in Israel. Uh, one example is we have no fo real fog chambers for automotive testing in Israel. These are huge tunnels, 200 meter long, with uh, um, climate control to allow you to control the, the, the ambient light, to control the kind of fog, if you want radiative fog, advocative fog, uh, rain, what, what strength is the rain, and even snow. And, and each car has to, each sensor, we're talking here about sensor, has to pass those tests in order to be, to be validated. Um, yeah, so this is the main gap that we see, I think. So about manpower, well, we all know the, the shortage of manpower. Um, if you look, especially in the AI domain, the cost, or actually we, we are buying, so it's the price. The price of an engineer is very expensive today for companies. Extremely expensive, unlogically expensive sometimes. Uh, and this is because there are not too many people and they can actually choose. Um, and other, other uh, manpower that is missing or uh, that we are lacking, as I said, is for the test facilities. These are specially engineering fields that are not dealt at all in Israel. Um, uh, special testing uh, uh, facilities are lacking also and we need the people to operate them. Uh, I would say also there is a shortage of uh, uh, analog VLSI engineers. We are as a vertical company who develops the product from the CMOS itself to the 
a system level, we, we see a shortage of VLSI engineers as well. It's coming. Yeah, so I will not start to complain about the fact that uh, uh, great people are missing because it's uh, a known problem. I just can share with you that uh, in tri -I, we do look for uh, the brightest minds. Uh, I can tell that uh, the intellectual challenge that we provide to our team members, uh, I think you could not find it anywhere, starting from the device physics through the analog, the digital, the ISP pipeline, all over, uh, you can find uh, uh, great challenges uh, that uh, we need to solve. Um, I will just share one anecdote about tri -I. Uh, Since inception, uh, we are currently about 85 people, I think. Only uh, two people uh, left the company since inception. And I think that uh, that says uh, a big thing about our culture and how we uh, provide all the resources for our team uh, to win this uh, game of uh, sensing and provide the best in class product to the automotive market and to more uh, additional industries. So, yes, uh, we thought that, uh, Ratsi, we thought that uh, developing Imaging radar, again, with the cost and uh, performance, it's a very challenge, but we found that recruiting people, it's sometimes more challenge than uh, developing the product. So, um, yes, uh, what we are doing first, we are trying to work with the academy. Uh, that's first. Uh, we have a special programs in order to recruit um, people from the university and just study them, you know, uh, work with them. It's only what we found that the engineers, um, most of them has a know-how uh, about specific field, but um, we found that lack of uh, the way to see it in, uh, um, to see the system, the entire system. So in order to solve problems, you, it's very important to understand the entire uh, system and then the only algorithms or antenna, something like this. So uh, that's what we are trying to do in, in RAD-C uh, because of uh, the lack of engineering in Israel and I think all over the world. Uh, more than this, um, I think with the, with the university, uh, more uh, to offer more classes and specific fields in specific fields like um, RF in high frequency, DSPs, antennas. That I think it could be help. Uh, practicums programs like you know other department in the university. And um, one more issue that I would like to raise: um, I would like to see more women in this field. I would like to see more women uh, in startup companies. Please do not afraid to take the risk. Even here, I cannot see, you know, a lot of women, unfortunately. And I think it's very important, Razi for sure, and I'm sure all the companies, uh, startup companies, and it's important to the, uh, it's important to the industry and it's important to the community that, you know, women will be part of this uh, game. So it's, uh, I, I think we're doing pretty well. I mean, we, we started the company, my co-founders and myself, beginning of 2016, uh, and we're about 400 people now. So we grew pretty quickly uh, from four people then to 400 now. Uh, so yeah, so, uh, but it's not a solved problem for us yet. So uh, I, think, I think we can do much better. I think um, I'll say what the one thing that's missing relating to what I said earlier is um, getting people with uh, the product experience specifically around uh, automotive and just something that's generally missing I think in Israel is just product culture. Um, 
people like to develop cool technologies, but it's not the same thing as kind of bringing product all the way. Um, I think the way we approach it, I think what makes us relatively successful in this is just the tremendous focus we have on hiring. Uh, so besides going into like uh, price wars with other companies, and which is pretty difficult because you've got some of the, uh, you know, very cash-rich R&D centers of some of the, you know, the, the, the Googles and the Apples here that kind of hard to compete uh, on every uh, offer that you, that you you give a person, and, and that kind of things they we don't do that. That kind of escalates pretty quickly, and you don't want to go there. Um, so what we do do is as we just put a lot of focus onto this. It's not just a side job for us. It's not something. It's like unrelated to the business, it is the business. I mean, the management attention, um, you know, co-founders, management, uh, to getting the best people is just something we put a very big part of our time in and I think we get good results. Prices of your product are much more expensive than the market can uh, work with. Can you elaborate on this? What do you expect from your prices of uh, all of you? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I can tell only about TriEye. Um, about TriEye, so we designed our solutions from scratch, um, as I said. Uh, to meet uh, high volume requirements and mass market uh, price point. So in terms of pricing, I don't think that's the issue of tri -I. Um What we're getting from the industry is that uh, we are well suited for mass market price point. about Ratsi, uh, so uh, what we thought, from my experience, I was a CEO of other uh, companies that uh, uh, actually uh, developed and manufacturing mass production for the automotive field before I uh, started uh, or founded uh, Ratsi. So as I mentioned before, we thought from the beginning how we are uh, developing a cost a uh, game-changing cost structure, that's what we said, and performance, because we understood that this uh, traditional market, the cost is the key. Uh, so yes, uh, that's why we use off-the-shelf components, which is not easy uh, to use off-the-shelf components and still come with uh, a higher uh, uh, performance and a cost. And uh, yes, we are working with uh, tier ones and OEMs, and uh, it meets uh, the, the requirements in the cost bomb and uh, also with the performance. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, the, the secret right to getting to the low cost and the tremendous value that you get when you're buying a car is, is really the volume, right? So. Um, everybody here I'm sure designed their product with kind of the mindset of like some kind of a price constraint and therefore made some technology choices we did as well and I'm happy to elaborate but it really doesn't happen unless you're getting to millions of units uh, at least over a lifetime and eventually in a year and I think this is where the industry needs companies like us because uh, contrary to some of the traditional tier ones that kind of expect they look at the standalone project they expect to amortize all their big development costs in a single project uh, and that kind of that doesn't solve this chicken and egg problem, right? Because then the price is too high, the project doesn't happen, and the decision get, just keeps getting delayed. Uh, what we did is basically we're willing to take risks. So uh, even though you know we raised a, a, a ton of money and we've invested a ton of money into the development of this product, um, we have a mindset of like what what is the horizon? Like what is this technology really good for? Uh, and we are willing to you know amortize into a larger volume. And therefore, being able to quote at the prices that the industry needs to kind of kickstart this, you know, virtuous cycle of um, 
making the RFQs bigger, being able to like eventually really look at the uh, RFQs of, of millions of units per year, but somebody needs to make the upfront investment and you know, we, we see ourselves as one of the companies doing that. I'll just add to it, as a startup company, um, first of all, your, your goal is to have a design win. And I would say that, first of all, our product has never met the limitation of the price yet for solving the problem that we are solving in design. It's, a, it's more a problem of the requirement from the market. Second, uh, you have to find the right market. So f our first serial production that we're doing today, where we are selling the serial products, uh, not in real automotive uh, regular cars, but in light transportation, like a uh, light rail. So if you find the right market for your uh, existing situation, it, it eases, it doesn't solve the chicken and egg problem that was mentioned here, but it eases the, the problem because you, you start running the, 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 the engine, not in full speed, but still you start running it and you know where, it, where you can save money as you get towards the high volume that you need. Thank you very much. So, I'd like to thank Opera and Adi Peoren. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to invite our next panelist. David representing the Avatar Consortium. And Dr. Ivan Kimati representing the data fusion from Via Vision Labertech and the Eud Spiegel from Cognata representing the simulation part. So um, the academia is great at uh, bringing the state of the art at, um, uh, and the uh, most cutting edge uh, solutions, but uh, the gap between uh, product and, uh, and the research is pretty, pretty uh, big. So uh, consortium are great to uh, bridge this gap and, uh, and the relationships that the academia and the industry are uh, experiencing in, in, inside the consortium is uh, a great platform for uh, enabling uh, the future products. As Gal said, it's more interesting to look uh, a few years into the future and not uh, just solving uh, small features and uh, really bringing uh, new ideas that can change the uh, the. the Angle or the direction of the industry. From your experience, do you see any ways to enhance the product? What? To enhance uh, cooperation? Yeah, I, I think that Gao uh, and myself are a good example of how the industry and academia uh, blur the, the line because Gao is working in media. I'm. Uh, I'm uh, there are some bad examples as well. Sorry? Probably there are some bad examples. 
Yes, but 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 uh, this is uh, bringing students into the uh, into the industry while they're, they are studying or vice versa. Bringing uh, researcher into the uh, industry to lead uh, lead our community groups are good ways to to uh, bridge this gap and uh, enable productization and good products to the in, into the industry and uh, fertilize the research uh, in the academia. Thank you. Ivan, from you representing AI in SAM, what do uh, you see in the previous panel of the SAM, so what do uh, you do, what do you do with that for the AI? What do you like to do different than that? Well, uh, different sensors have different characteristics, and we have seen it in the previous uh, discussion here, in the previous panel. For example, camera, they have a high resolution, but cannot work under the weather condition. They still have the understanding of the distance. So, so basically, with a camera, you cannot uh, know what is the distance to, to, your, to, the, to the car that in front of you. So, so what, what we do, we, we, we use uh, fusion. And, and the way we do the fusion is, is by you know, there are companies that do perception of each sensor along with the the data. However, this is uh, um, not efficient and it's not um, actually the SNR is lower doing it in this way. And, and what we do, we do all that we do. First, we arrange the data in a format that uh, we can apply one AI in this uh, use data and then we run this. Uh, your DNA on, on, on the fuse data. And as a result of that, you can get better results from each sensor. So, I mean, basically, the camera has a high resolution, the light and the red has a low resolution, and by fusing it, you can get the best result. Thank you. Now, what is the video? Repeat the question. What uh, gaps do you see in the sample? Sure. So, uh, let me say, I'm not a, a sensor person per se, but I think there are two really interesting directions um, how AI and sensors play out. One is that there is more smartness in the sensors. If you, if you go back and think uh, about like naive, maybe go back, uh, there's reality, it emits signals, there are sensors that sense that, and a long time ago you just emit these signals. But now you realize that. Oh, yes, uh, multi sensor information. So you realize that what sensors actually need to do is to solve an inference problem. They need to provide more information about the reality, right, than, than about the signal. So there, there could be smartness that, uh, more smartness goes into the sensor. Now there's the other direction, it's actually also very interesting, is that the sensors, of course, they, are, they don't stand alone. There's a, a more and more complex post-processing of that data. And I think uh, Point Cloud and, and LiDAR is, is one clear example. Um, the, the type of data of Point Clouds, um, it's, it's not trivial how you process that with deep networks. Uh, even our current solutions like PointNet uh, still suffer from a lot of uh, really, uh, hard technical challenges like invariance to shift, invariance to translation, uh, uh, how do you take care of time. So, so the point is that when you design sensors, you also uh, want to think about the are going to be post-processed there. Okay, thank you. And so what do you think uh, how simulation can help uh, to realize Okay, I'm happy you asked me this question because simulation many times is perceived as like a, a, some video game or very high quality movie, but it's not that. Uh, the challenge of, of uh, make, bringing AV and Ada's project into the market, challenge is the cost, reliability, and time to market. And you need about more than 10 billion kilometers in order to verify uh, autonomous car. You need, many people that not know it, you need a uh, like, like a 
2 to 20 million drive to verify each function, each change in sensor, each change in position of the sensor. Initially, you're going to do real rise for verifying that, you come summing up with 20 million dollars for every change. So simulation helps in all of this, in base design, base verification, and changes verification. So how simulation work, you have 3D model, and then you can either use a simulated AU car instead of the real car and get the data sets for the initial training, but you can also drive your target car inside the simulation using a simple uh, gas brakes and, and steering commands. And you can do it even real time with highly accelerated processor on the cloud and you get to test the car real time in the real situation in many environments, city, highway, off-road. All of this simulation enables not just this, and challenge is also how to test the results. The simulation also support analysis tool for automatic verification of the result, which means you can cut more than 90% of the time, more than 90% of the cost in development, testing, verification of sim using simulation. So I think simulation is a vital tool to ensure time to market, to ensure cost, to ensure availability, and more than to ensure safety, because the simulation can also try many variations to get to the optimal result, the optional op optimal training, the optimal safety overall. Thank you. And the question to all of you, what do you think uh, in the more of that driven world uh, in that kind of role in AI research at all? Well, I think I mentioned that in the previous discussion, Basically, when we are working uh, with the academy in you know, distance social, you know, it's really going great. And, 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 and basically, the, the academy should focus on, on the horizon, follow on, on the way. You know. It's not what we need to resolve today. It's, it's basically, it's orthogonal to our work today. And I, I can give you examples I mean, uh, how to optimize the uh, DNA network, how, how to move to AP efficient, how to work better with the data and, and have more accuracy with, with smaller data being connected. So, so it's not how to product, productize, but how to make support and, and what should be also the next idea that will change the market. So beyond the horizon thing, I think one thing that PhD students are allowed to do is to fail. They should try risky, weird things, uh, you know, come with crazy ideas and fail. And, and the, the, the cost of failure in a PhD is, is somewhat small. Right. Uh, I will touch uh, another point in the relationship the academia uh, or uh, the the kind of edge the academia can bring to the table that is the education because uh, the academia had a really long a hard, and hard time to adapt to the deep learning uh, search. So it took almost four or five years until a very good courses in Israel, yeah? in the United States it was much earlier, but, but in Israel it took almost five years until we had very good courses from all, all around the uh, academia world. world. And, it's, um, it's, it's not uh, a, a possible anymore in a digital age that it, uh, it will take so much time to adapt to a disruptive uh, change like this. So uh, we need to enable a, a researcher to, or a, a, the, the, one that, uh, the one that wants to educate more to, to be able to, uh, uh, to um, uh, bring up new courses and uh, new abilities to educate the uh, students and also uh, reward them for, for this part because there is not, no much reward for education in academia, it, it is much more for research. And it's a gap that uh, I think uh, uh, we need to address. Yes. The race is actually impossible. The academy will not be able to reach the level of uh, level is wrong world, but the amount of uh, topics which are being held in the industry. So the academy should initiate plans like you're doing at the STRC to search what the industry needs, to ask the industry, and then to offer uh, various research which will help for what the industry will need 
to know tourism now, freeism from now. Now, in terms of educating the, the, the students, you cannot uh, get all, all the aspects of AI that are changing on a daily basis, but the academy can educate the students and the researchers to act in the way that AI development and research is being done, which means they should learn uh, how to take a problem, how to define the, 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 the ingredients, how to define the testing procedure, because the most important issue in AI is testing the results, to know that your results are fine. In, in AI, they are meaning they are talking life. So if the academy will teach the students various project, task, a, a, a workshop in the industry, how to take an, a, a problem to research it, to define the solution and test it by itself, then the research of the student will be perfectly ready to work with the industry. Okay. Thank you very much. And probably the last question for all of you, how we can accelerate the research from all sides and also join the research academy as well. How can we support the young students and those who are the fail to move forward and bring more research on the AI and compare from industry? How can the industry participate in that more? I, I will start. Uh, talk, uh, simulation is, I think, the main tool for accelerating the development of AI in ADAS. And Cognata will be happy to have the university uh, to give them service in, in very, let's say, in university program uh, in business term. Uh, we are doing for university of helping the formula group. We are helping uh, 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 RL University in training tailor operators. So just come to us and we find the right plane to work with you, to help you, to train you, to make you using simulation the most efficient way. Thank you, Jan. Um, I think that enabling cooperation is the main, uh, the main idea or the main focus that we should. Ah. So uh, we need to uh, be able to make more uh, initiative like the consortium that uh, take long time, so we don't need programs that are one year long or two year long. It's not, uh, it's not feasible and not um, uh, sufficient for uh, research. So we need to take longer initiatives and, uh, and enable and make a kind of, uh, um, uh, of a joint um, a contribution co and cooperation between the industry and the academy that will benefit them both. Yeah. First, I agree that uh, it is a lot about long-term relationships. Uh, everyone knows that. Um, how should we support the students? Well, we should pay them more, right? Um, once they graduate, they, their salary jumps four times, five times, right? So they clearly bring huge value to Israel, to the industry, and we should find ways. Uh, and, and then you'll have more PhD students, more master's students. Uh, we also have very little, very few, sorry, very few faculty in this area. Still, the, uh, me and my friends, we are swamped by, um, really, daily we get uh, people that want to do research in this, in this area and, and training. And this relates back to what uh, Joran said about, about education. Uh, research is, uh, is based on mentorship, right? There's this long process of iterative, uh, and, and courses just get you part of the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the consortium is a very good place to enable the work together the academy and the industry. And, and I think this is the only place that is working. Uh, no, it's important to, to understand that because um, if you are going to a professor and ask him to walk with, to walk with you, the issue and, and that the, the university is putting this burden, making a, a lot of difficulties. And the person today is the only way to overcome that. I think the government should, should you know, regulate it differently. Uh, that the IP will not stay in the academy and will go much easier to do it. This is one very important. I think another issue is uh, I have a few uh, people which want to be but want to say, hey, why I wish I didn't know about it. 
And, and today, there is no incentive for university to, to do this type of things. You know, to take a person that is working in the industry and want to do PhD and want to do his master, but still work uh, as part of a company. And, and, and I think this is a, you know, a challenge that I'm giving you. I mean, how, I mean, how to resolve that? I mean, I think it's a, it, it, it is very important. This will enable much more uh, students to do PhD and, and to do master degree, and, but still work. And, and actually, the things that they are doing are not much different than, than what you do in the academy. Thank you very much. You raised very important points. And we would like to thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.